Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Today, the Biden-Harris administration announced that manufacturers of all 10 drugs selected for negotiation have decided to participate in the Inflation Reduction Act's Medicare drug price negotiation program. Another major step in President Biden's fight to lower health care costs for seniors and families. Last year alone, 9 million seniors spent $3.4 billion in out-of-pocket costs on these 10 drugs to treat conditions like heart failure, diabetes, arthritis, blood clots, Crohn's disease, and more. President Biden and congressional Democrats finally beat Big Pharma and allowed Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices for the first time in our nation's history, despite every single Republican in Congress voting against the Inflation Reduction Act. Today's announcement builds on the work of this administration to lower health care costs, including capping the cost of insulin to 35 bucks for seniors, making vaccines free for Medicare and Medicaid enrollees, and saving 15 million Americans 800 bucks per year on health insurance premiums. President Biden will continue fighting to lower health care costs for American families, no matter how many challenges Republicans and Big Farmer put in our way. Uh, finally, as you all know, we're joined here by the Admiral, Admiral John Kirby, who is here to discuss the President's calls this morning uh, with uh, some of our partners and allies to coordinate on how we are going to continue uh, to uh, continue to support Ukraine and also take some of your foreign policy questions. I, I should say that our conversation back in the back <laughs> I should call you out. I'm going to tell you out. Tell us more. She probably will. <laughs> I don't know. We didn't, wasn't sure if you knew Taylor Swift. I know. <laughs> All right. Apparently, she's dating a football player. Yes. Like the biggest story of the week. Like the biggest story. Right? That's what we can. Anything you can tell us on our front. About front? Uh, you know. All the gossip. Does here. President Biden think it's weird? <laughs> the relationship? <laughs> I, you know, in the vernacular of the National Security Council, I can neither confirm nor deny those reports. Will you um, take the question? I will happily take the question back to our analysts. Um, so, look, uh, I think you all are tracking, but if, uh, but in case you're not, earlier this morning, uh, the president did convene a call with allies and partners to coordinate our ongoing support for the people of Ukraine as they defend their freedom and independence against Russia's brutal invasion. The President reaffirmed the strong commitment of the United States to supporting Ukraine as it defends itself for as long as it takes, uh, as did every other leader on the call. The leaders discussed efforts to continue providing Ukraine with the ammunition and the weapon systems that it needs to defend its territory and to continue strengthening Ukrainian air defenses as they pre prepare for more attacks on critical infrastructure now, certainly, but also certainly in the winter months ahead. In that vein, they also talked about joint efforts to repair and harden Ukraine's energy infrastructure throughout the winter. Finally, the leaders spent some time discussing ways that they can align and broaden donor efforts to support Ukraine's economic recovery, as well as to work together with the global community to address the energy, economic, and food security challenges that are being caused by Russia's war well outside of the European continent. Uh, joining President Biden on the call was Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, President von der Leyen of the European Commission, President Michel of the European Council, Chancellor Schultz of Germany, Prime Minister Maloney of Italy, Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, President Duda of Poland, President Ioannis of Romania, and Prime Minister Sunak of the United Kingdom, as well as the Foreign Minister of France, uh, Foreign Minister Colonna. Now, this call, of course, comes on the heels of the continuing resolution passed by Congress over the weekend, a bill that did not include funding to support Ukraine. As President Biden made clear, we cannot under any circumstances allow America's support for Ukraine to be interrupted. Time is not our friend. We have enough funding authorities to meet Ukraine's battlefields, battlefield needs for a bit longer. But we need Congress to act to ensure that there is no disruption in our support this is particularly important as the Defense Department seeks to replenish its stocks from the drawdown authority that it's been giving now, almost 50 drawdown packages. As Ukrainians wage a tough counteroffensive, as their children continue to get ripped from the bosom of their families, and as winter fast approaches, it is imperative that we help them take advantage of every single day. A lapse in support for even a short period of time 
could make all the difference on the battlefield. Just as critically, such a lapse in support will make Putin believe that he can out, he can wait us out, uh, and that the that he can continue the conflict until we, and our allies and our partners, fold. A strong signal of support now, and into next year, will make it clear to Putin that he's wrong about that too, just like his assumptions have been wrong throughout this entire conflict. We know that the vast majority of members in Congress support additional help for Ukraine, and we know and appreciate their statements to that effect, including those of Speaker McCarthy. And as evidenced in today's call, we know that the world is watching. U.S. leadership has galvanized international support and has been critical to rallying the world. American leadership remains key to ensuring that support for Ukraine continues. So the president looks forward to working with Congress to ensure that we make good on our commitment. And he has every expectation that Speaker McCarthy will keep his public commitment to secure the passage of the support needed to help Ukraine at this critical moment. I'll close with this. Supporting Ukraine strengthens our national security. It's the right thing to do, not just for the Ukrainian people, but for the American people as well. Countering Putin's ability to wage war on a neighboring nation may actually prevent a larger conflict in which American troops might be needed. And it sends a strong signal to other would-be aggressors who may be considering military action and invasions of their neighbor's territory that that sort of action is unacceptable and they will pay the consequences, they will be held accountable by the United States and by the international community. With that, I'll take some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John, you said that the president is confident that Speaker McCarthy will keep his commitment. Are you concerned that Speaker McCarthy's ability or inability to keep his job <coughs> may impact that? Well, that's clearly going to be up for uh, you know, the, his conference in the House and the House of Representatives to, to decide that's not something that the, uh, that the president's going to get involved in or, um, uh, or necessarily be overtly concerned about right now. I mean, he has made public commitments that he'll support Ukraine. I would also add, regardless of what happens in the House of Representatives, that all the House leadership is supportive of continuing to help Ukraine. And the vast majority of House members on the Republican side are in support of continuing to help Ukraine. There's a small number of very vocal, a small minority of, of, of vocal members who are, are pushing back on that, but they don't represent their party, they don't represent their leadership. Did the President address the chaos in the House of Representatives on his call with foreign leaders today? The President certainly uh, uh, talked to the leaders about the, the, the vote over the weekend and uh, expressed to them exactly what I expressed to you, that he's confident that we're going to continue to have bipartisan and bicameral support uh, up on Capitol Hill and that the United States will continue to meet our commitments. Thanks. Um, Kirby, you said that you were looking for a strong signal of support now and into next year. Um, obviously, the administration's request on the table right now is through the end of the fiscal year. Um, does that suggest that your strategy is now shifted to want one vote on Ukraine for the entire fiscal year? And do you have an updated package for you know, how much money you want since we're now kind of into that? Thing? Yeah, the short answer to both those questions is no. Uh, we still uh, stand by the supplemental request that we, that we submitted to Congress, and we're still pushing, obviously, to have uh, that funding uh, granted. Just a little bit. We reported that there are Taiwanese firms that are helping China um, develop uh, chip factories in China. Is, is the U.S. investigating export, possible export control violations there? And it, more broadly, if you can't answer that, can you gauge concern that, that our domestic chips program is potentially pushing our partner Taiwan towards Beijing? So I've seen the press reports. I can't confirm the accuracy of those reports one way or another. Obviously, no surprise to us that Huawei will be looking uh, to find ways to continue uh, uh, illicit production of, of semiconductors and particularly uh, working uh, throughout the PRC to do that. I can't confirm the specific reports about Taiwan. And then on uh, export controls, again, no announcements or anything to make today, but we're confident uh, in the export controls that we have in place. That, uh, that they will be helpful in terms of protecting uh, the supply chain for semiconductors uh, here in the United States. And that, uh, look, we're not, you know, it's not static. We're going to constantly look at the regime. And if it needs to be changed or adjusted, we'll absolutely do that in the future. The president has been firm, but, you know, you've seen it in the CHIPS Act, that 
uh, he wants the supply chain to start here, not end here. And it's got to be more resilient. And we're going to stay committed to being flexible in the tools we have to do that. Uh, thanks. I wanted to ask about, um, you know, you all have been saying that there is bipartisan support in Congress, which there certainly is for the Ukraine funding. But if you look at broader public opinion support, it has diminished from the point of when this war started. Some polls showing that a majority of Americans do not continue, support continued funding for Ukraine. And so I am wondering what your message is to, to that growing segment of the public, and if you have concerns about that diminishing support over time amongst the American public. I, look, I, I can't speak to individual polls, um, and certainly the American people should speak for themselves. We believe that Americans understand what's at stake here. We believe that Americans understand that it's not, although it is first and foremost about Ukraine and the Ukrainian people and their sovereignty, it is bigger than that. And the American people understand that, that, that there's more at stake here than just the borders of Ukraine. It's the, the vast security environment on the European continent. And it's the very idea of independence, which is a founding ideal in this country. If there's one thing that all Americans, no matter who you vote for, can get behind, it's the idea of independence. That's what Ukraine's fighting for, their right to be an independent state. It's what we fought for in 1776. And most Americans will also know and remember that we didn't win and secure our independence without foreign help from abroad. Same, that's all Ukraine's asking for. They're just asking for foreign help and assistance to, to, to do this fighting. And they're the ones doing this fighting. So we're going to continue to, to make the case. We're going to continue to, uh, to make it clear to Congress and to the American people what we're doing and why we're doing it. But there is so much more at stake here uh, than just Ukraine. And again, we think that Amer the American people understand that. Thank you very much, Karin. Uh, Mr. Kirby, I'm getting a chance after four months, so I hope I can ask just two questions. Uh, yeah, that's up to you. Right? I mean, after that statement, maybe you just get one question. <laughs> Ooh, so should I combine them or what should I do? Just, I think you're wasting okay. our time, sir. Can uh, you please so, Mr. Kirby, I had asked you about uh, Pakistan providing weapons to Ukraine, and you said to ask uh, Pakistani official. Um, and what did they tell you? And the U.S. news media outlet published a story that Pakistan was a plank, uh, supplying critical weapons in the Ukraine war and was getting huge funds from the U.S. I'm just wondering, there's so much emphasis on Ukraine war, but you're not highlighting one of your allies just right next door who's helping uh, in the war. And just combined with that, there was a huge protest, one of the biggest one against President Biden, just right outside here by the Pakistani community. The State Department was denying that Imran Khan was not removed under the U.S. But again, the U.S. media presented documents that he was removed after President Biden's uh, disliking for him or something. So why is this whole confusion going on since last one year? There's more than 50 nations providing support to Ukraine, and typically we allow those nations to speak to what they're doing. Some, some countries give lethal capabilities, some don't. Some give financial assistance, some don't. Some don't want a lot of public attention on the support they're giving to Ukraine. So we respect that. So I'll let Pakistan speak for what it's doing for Ukraine. Uh, on your question about Imran Khan, I, you're, you're suggesting that there's some sort of linkage here to uh, his removal and these protests and, and some sort of uh, American action. This, was the, the, this is a domestic issue for the Pakistani people and the Pakistani government to speak to and to deal with. Go ahead, Catherine. Uh, Thanks. Go ahead, Catherine. Uh, John, do you think the Pentagon will have to begin conserving what it sent to Ukraine, given the sort of budgetary uncertainty? I think in coming weeks, you'll see a, a relatively consistent uh, and co continuity of support to Ukraine through drawdown authority. The Pentagon still has several billion dollars available to it in unexpired but yet appropriated uh, presidential drawdown authority. So look, we've been providing security assistance to Ukraine about every two weeks, and I think you're going to continue to see that be the case for coming weeks. But absent additional funding by Congress, appropriated funding, such as the supplemental we asked for, eventually, you know, yeah, you're, you, you, you run into a hard stop there. And we want to make sure that, as I said in my opening statement, that there's no lapse, that we're able to continue this consistent process of providing them support, particularly as we get into the fall and this counteroffensive continues. Uh, they, you know, there's about six to eight more weeks of decent weather here, uh, of good fighting weather, and we want to make sure that the Ukrainians can succeed. And do you have any 
Commandant, reports that India has told Canada to remove a number of diplomats from the country. I'll let these two countries speak to their bilateral relations. Go ahead. Uh, Thank back. you, Kerry. Thank you so much, Kerry. Uh, thank you, John. Um, a couple of uh, days ago, you said that um, you're seeing build up of U.S. troops, the, sorry, Serbian uh, troops on the border with Kosovo. Is it still the same? Uh, and uh, why is U.K. sending uh, troops to Kosovo? Why is the U.K.? The U.S. is going to be part of the NATO troops in Kosovo. So on your first question, uh, since we uh, stated publicly that we had seen Serbian forces on the border, uh, we have also seen them start to move those forces away, and that's a good thing. Uh, that will help de-escalate the tensions. It won't eliminate them, but it'll help de-escalate them. Um, there are, as you know, a small number of U.S. forces that are part of the K-4, the, the Kosovo Force peacekeeping mission uh, that, uh, that NATO keeps there. A small number. I, I don't expect that number is going to change or, or there'll be any uh, additional U.S. troops uh, provided as a result of that. It's, uh, as I understand it, the UK is now in, in the cycle of leadership over K4, so really you have to speak to them for force allocation, but I don't anticipate any change in, in US force posture. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Kirby, thank you. Is the White House on board with tying additional aid to Ukraine with border security, as some Republican lawmakers have suggested, as a way to resolve this? We believe both are important, Peter. That's why in the supplemental if request... If one, you would be satisfied if that's the vehicle that it happens? We don't, we don't believe they, need, they should be tied, um, or, or one dependent on the other. But both are important. Both can be and both are important. And that's why in our supplemental request, in addition to some 12 to $13 billion for defense-related support, there's also $4 billion in there for border security enhancements. Can I ask a quick follow-up on that? Um, you, you say that you're confident that this is going to happen, that the Congress will provide the sufficient funds so that there is no lapse. My first thought is, how long can we afford for there to be a lapse if there is one? Is it a day? I get, Zero so, days. So does that mean Ukraine falls if there if one day goes by without U.S. funds? Is Ukraine I wouldn't out? go so far as to say Fine. Ukraine falls, so Peter, but we don't want to see any lapse. Any lapse. There shouldn't be any lapse. Now, what the, the, the leaders with whom the president spoke to today in that conference call, obviously you said there's confidence that the Congress will, will pass this. He's responding to the concerns that other leaders have about the U.S. will pass these funds. What is the basis for that confidence, and what do the foreign leaders say about their sense of confidence that the U.S. is going to do the right thing? Well, again, I don't want to speak for uh, all these foreign leaders, but I could tell you They're that... The, the, the president, yeah. Well, right. the president asked for the call. Uh, it wasn't that he was getting pressured by these foreign leaders for a conversation. He wanted to have the conversation, but let me go back. Uh, I won't speak for them, but I can tell you that, uh, that on the call, uh, none of the foreign leaders uh, expressed concerns about continued U.S. support. They understand what's going on up on Capitol Hill. They understand that this is a small minority of extreme Republicans that are holding this up, and that they, and they understand that the bulk of Republican leadership, House and the Senate, all support Ukraine. So I think there's a general sense uh, that this will obviously move forward and, and it will happen. But uh, it was a topic of conversation, but the impression that they all gave the president was that they understood what's going on, and they fully expect this support yeah, to continue. Um, Admiral, can I get just two timeline clarifications? Um, what is First, what is the John Kirby definition of a bit in terms of how long <coughs> the U.S. can continue to provide support to Ukraine under the current funding levels? Is it three weeks, four weeks? Is it a few months? Like, how, how long is a bit? I think given what we have left and given the pace at which we've been providing support. Um, I, you're talking perhaps um, uh, a couple of months or so, roughly. Now, it depends, Michael. I, the reason I, I'm being squishy on this is because it depends on what's going on on the battlefield and how big the packages are and what capabilities Ukraine needs. And the, as the war has evolved, so have the packages. And so I need a little bit of breathing room on what a bit means. but. But, you know, in coming yeah, weeks yeah, and a couple of months or so is roughly about right. Okay, and then, and the then, other thing that's important to me, I don't mean to talk too much here, but it's not just the authority that the presidential drawdown authority is not a check. It's not a checking account. It, it's, 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 it's how much authority they have to, to, to go to the inventory, to the shelves, and pull stuff off. And depending, each package costs different because the capabilities and the tools you're pulling off the shelf 
cost the Pentagon a different amount of money. Um, but what also has to be factored into your question about what is a bit is the replenishment authority for the Pentagon to restock those shells. And right now, the authority they have to replenish is less by a significant number of what they have authority to provide. And so in addition to the needs of the battlefield and the pace at which the drawdown is going, you also have to factor in when we talk about how long is a bit in how much authority the Pentagon has left to replenish its shelves. And just the other timeline question, the, you know, the president, you and you all have, have repeatedly said, and I, it sounds like he said again at the meeting today, that the U.S. is in this for as long as it takes, right? So as the president goes back to voters to face re-election, as a president who has in the past criticized the length of some of the wars that we've been engaged in in Afghanistan and Iraq, <clears throat> Does, is there any responsibility for the president to be specific about, with the voters, about how long he is, he thinks the United States should be willing to be involved in this? Should he be willing to say two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years? Like how long, you know, is, does, does he commit the United States to, to being in this system, in this situation of, of, what is costing tens and tens of billions of dollars on a regular basis? For as long as it takes means for as long as it takes. And the president has been very, very honest about that. Um, every other leader on the call also, um, in their own way, emphasized the, their commitment, again, for as long as it takes. Now, look, I mean, everybody, <laughs> we'd all like this war to end tomorrow. It could if Mr. Putin would do the right thing. Certainly the Ukrainians want it to end. Nobody wants to see this go on any longer. But it is their war. I, I, I understand that we are the leading contributor of support, but the Ukrainians are the ones fighting this war. We don't have American troops on the ground. So it's a, not a fair comparison to make with Iraq or Afghanistan where you had American boots on the ground. This is Ukraine war. They're fighting it. We are helping them fight it. We're giving them the foreign assistance that we ourselves have benefited from in our own history. Uh, and again, we're going to work as hard as we can with might and main to, to make it possible for Ukraine to end this war as soon as they can. But it has to be done on, in terms that President Zelensky is comfortable with, the Ukrainian people can accept, and that ends up with a whole, free, prosperous Ukraine with international recognized borders. Is forever war a fair term? I don't think so. Go ahead, Nancy. John, you said that the President expressed confidence to these world leaders <coughs> that the funding will be there. How can the President be confident in that when we might not have a Speaker of the House by the end of the day today. The House could be plunged into chaos. How can he have any confidence? Well, it goes back to my answer. It goes back to my answer to, to Jeff. Regardless of what happens to the Speaker himself, uh, every leader, uh, every relevant National Security Commitment Committee in the House has committed to, con to continue to supporting Ukraine. Of course, there's strong support on the Senate side on both sides of the aisle, but the same is true in the House. The, the leadership and the vast majority of Republicans in Congress in the House of Representatives support continuing to help Ukraine. But we have no idea who the next speaker will be or even when there will be another speaker. What if the speaker is one of these 117 Republicans who voted just last week not to uh, increase I, I, I can't possibly. I can't possibly speculate or get into hypotheticals about what's going to happen to the speakership in the House. I want to be clear about that. But again, there's enough support from Republicans in the House, not just members, although that's included, but leaders, that the President remains confident that we'll continue to get the support we need. Thanks, Thank Harry. Uh, 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 Jake. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, last week, Jake had two meetings with two South Asian leaders, one with India's National Affairs Minister S. Jayashankar, other with Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hashina. On India, did the issue of Canada was discussed uh, in the meeting? Are you, what was was the issue of Canada discussed in the meeting? Are you comfortable with India's explanation of things in the relationship with Canada? And do you think the U.S. has a role to play in India-Canada relationship, how to calm the situation down? The issue was discussed. We'll certainly leave it to those two countries to talk about their bilateral relationship. We've been clear. These allegations are serious. They need to be fully investigated. And of course, as we've said before, we urge India to participate actively in that investigation. And on Bangladesh, uh, how do you see the relationship between the U.S. and Bangladesh now? Last month, I think President Biden also had a full aside meeting with Sheikh Hashina in, in New Delhi. Uh, was the issue of elections in Rohingya refugees discussed? They did talk about the importance of free and fair elections. They also talked about the importance of 
uh, improving our bilateral relationship across a range of issues, including climate change. Thank you. So we've heard testimony from wounded Ukrainian soldiers who say that, who suggest that Ukrainian forces are outgunned, they're taking heavy losses, and they have no way of cracking heavy Russian defenses even at this current level of U.S. aid. So if U.S. support is significantly reduced, can Ukraine still defend itself? And is there a real risk here that Russia can retake its initiative in the war? Well, I mean, to be blunt, the answer to your first question is no, and the answer to your second question is yes. I mean, it is very important that Ukraine continue to get the support it needs on the battlefield. Um, I can't speak for battlefield conditions in any one area and how much ammunition they have, but, but we know that the counteroffensive has not gone as far or as fast as even the Ukrainians want it to. It's still a violent fight uh, on two major lines uh, of axes, one in the Donbass area and one down south, uh, south of Zaporizhia. And they're still fighting it out every single day. Um, and it's why I said in my opening statement, time is not our friend. Uh, we've got six to eight more weeks of good weather here before things really make it hard for both sides, quite frankly, to fight. We want to make sure that we take advantage of that. And as I said earlier to Jeff and I think to Peter's question, any lapse in the funding um, is going to be unhelpful to Ukraine. Yeah, John. Thanks a lot, Karine. Uh, John, you said earlier in response to a question that there are 50 countries that are assisting Ukraine in their fight against Russia. Why can't uh, Ukraine make do? With just that support, why is it necessary for the U.S. to also be a part of this military, economic, and humanitarian aid? Well, there a lot, there's a lot there. First of all, uh, there's incredible convening power by the United States, um, uh, and it's hard to see that there would be that level of international support so widespread. And it's well beyond Europe, man. We're talking about countries in the Indo-Pacific region that are providing lethal capabilities to Ukraine without U.S. leadership, without us convening holding these contact group meetings that Secretary Austin has, uh, has hosted. Uh, U.S. convening power, U.S. leadership on the world stage matters. People follow our example. That's number one. Number two, we have and continue to have the, the most powerful military in the world um, and the largest, most capable defense industrial base in the world. There's no other nation that can produce the kinds of arms and equipment and systems that the United States can. Uh, so it, without United States support, it would be very, very difficult for, uh, because I mean, some, many, many of these other nations are, use, are, are, do, are donating and contributing U.S. purchased or U.S. contributed equipment. So without our support, um, it's not inconceivable um, that some of that other support uh, would be harder for Ukraine to achieve. There's just, I'm sorry. No, no, the, the, okay. the, 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 the the scope and the scale, the ferociousness of the fighting right now on the counteroffensive, and the, uh, the expenditure rate of munitions means that there has to be a sufficient production capability to back it up. And no other nation has that, like the United States. Now, we know we have to continue to accelerate our own production <laughs> capability, but no other nation can do that but, but the United States. So it's really important that, that we stay in this fight with Ukraine and that we continue to lead the world as we have under President Biden's leadership in providing their support. And just to follow up, if there is not passage of a new aid package by Congress, does Ukraine risk uh, essentially depleting its munitions, depleting its military equipment? It would depend on whether there is a lapse and for how long it is. And it would also depend on what's going on on the battlefield. I mean, some days they expend more than others. I mean, you know, it's, it's war, it's combat. Every day is different in every location, so it's hard to answer that question yeah. accurately. On the upcoming uh, drawdowns, uh, this summer Jake Sullivan was describing cluster munitions as a bridge in supplies. Is the U.S. expecting to send more cluster munitions in these upcoming drawdown packages? I'm not going to get ahead of future packages. Uh, we don't typically uh, uh, foretell what's going to be in there. Uh, these cluster munitions have been uh, a, a significant enabler of Ukrainian uh, efforts to blow through Russian defenses, and again, we'll just we'll take a look at it with each and every package, but I, I, I can't forecast it. And since they've been, these cluster munitions have been being used for the past couple of months. Is the U.S. aware of any harm from the U.S. provided cluster munitions to civilians? or? I, I don't know that they've not been used in the last couple of months, um, and I'm not aware of any uh, indications that, that we've seen that um, there's been civilian harm as a result of them. In fact, and I don't want to speak for DOD too much, but, uh, but the reports that we've been getting from uh, our Pentagon colleagues is that the Ukrainians are using the cluster munitions in exactly the appropriate way, They're going behind Russian lines to hit at 
uh, command and control and other logistics and sustainment uh, or large formations of Russian troops, which is exactly what those munitions were designed for. We've seen no indications that they've been used inappropriately. Go ahead, Anita. Thank you. I have a question about the Arctic and another about Afghanistan. Starting with the Arctic, um, is the U.S. concerned about a surge of Russian crude oil shipments to Chinese ports through the Northern <coughs> Sea Route, uh, which is something we've seen in recent weeks? And are you concerned about overall increased cooperation between Beijing and Moscow in the Arctic sphere? Largely than the cooperation we've seen between those two countries in the Arctic has been economic and scientific. That's been the, mainly the scope of their cooperation. There's been some military exercises in the high north, but, but really they've been mostly focused on economic and science. And uh, um, look, we nothing's changed about the fact that we want to see a, a, a free and open, prosperous Arctic region that all nations that border the Arctic can benefit from. Nobody's looking for conflict uh, up there. We'll watch this as closely as we can. But again, uh, nothing that's going to change our posture, or our policy with respect to uh, seeking opportunities for everyone to benefit uh, from, uh, from the Arctic. And then uh, look on the oil, all I'll just say is there's a reason the price cap is in place. Um, uh, it has been effective in managing supply and demand and limiting Putin's ability to profiteer uh, off oil. I'm not saying he hasn't gotten any profits. Of course he has, but it, it has limited his ability uh, to uh, to make exorbitant profit, profits so that he can fund his war in Ukraine. We urge every country, and that includes the PRC, to abide by the price cap. Uh, on Afghanistan, really quickly, um, Representative McCall is criticizing the White House for what he says is uh, attempting to normalize relations with the Taliban, um, and, and in doing so, they're, you know, he says that that's hurtful and injurious. Uh, what is the reaction to this? I, I haven't seen his comments, so uh, it, it's hard for me to be specific, and uh, I haven't seen them, uh, but it, it's hard to, it, it's just hard to look at what we're doing and say that we're normalizing anything with the Taliban. We've not recognized them as a governing power uh, in Afghanistan. They want that, they want the legitimacy, then they need to meet their commitments. I mean, how can you effectively govern, how can you effectively have a useful economy when basically half your workforce, all women, are not are prohibited from being a, a, a part of that process? So we're gonna keep holding them accountable for their commitments. Um, now, look, does that mean we don't have any conversations, uh, that we're not allowed to have any conversations with the Taliban? Of course not. We're still working to try to get our allies and partners in Afghanistan out. That takes conversation. It takes dialogue. But it's important to the United States to keep meeting our word to the, the, uh, the people that helped us for 20 years. And does it mean that, uh, that we, we don't still have shared counterterrorism threats? Absolutely we do. And the Taliban has been fighting. Uh, against ISIS-K, particularly inside their country, hard to see, again, not seeing the, uh, the chairman's comments, but hard to see how uh, it would be irresponsible for us not to continue to work on counterterrorism efforts. Go ahead, Phil. Thank you, Karen. I think, as a matter of fact, I'd say we'd owe the American people a significant apology if we somehow, because we have issues with the way the Taliban is governing, we just turned a blind eye to counterterrorism threats that might still persist in Afghanistan. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, First, when you and I spoke earlier this year, you noted that the administration had not seen uh, any military or financial assistance falling prey to any kind of corruption in Ukraine. Is that still the case? And then second, uh, SEMA 4 is reporting that the Chief of Staff for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations, Christopher Mayer, uh, his chief was allegedly part of an Iranian influence campaign and had access to top secret environmental information. Does the NSC have an assessment of that? Was national security compromised? Has the president been briefed? No, I think we've seen the press reporting, but I'd refer you to DOD on that one completely. Um, and then on your first question, still no indication that there's been any kind of widespread corruption or, or inappropriate use of U.S. capabilities. As a matter of fact, I don't know who that asked me before about expenditure rates, but I mean, oftentimes the stuff that's getting to Ukraine, it, it's going hand to mouth. I mean, you know, matter of days before some stuff gets there, and then a matter of days more before it's being used on the battlefield. Not not every system, of course, but the Ukrainians are in a very active fight. They're using the stuff that's being provided to them. Senator Angus King um, told me earlier this year that he communicated to the Zelensky administration that any type of um, corruption or graft could really screw this up. Has the administration communicated 
to the Ukrainians just how important yes. this good government is to keep the... 100%. Uh, at various levels, including the leader level. Uh, do you think that the change of governments in Europe will affect the support ultimately to Ukraine? And I have Slovakia in mind. It, it's hard to say. I mean, every nation has to speak for their own domestic political situation, just like President Biden had to speak uh, this weekend about uh, about this one here. All I can tell you is on the call today, it was very clear to the president that these leaders all unanimously continue to want to support Ukraine with security assistance and economic assistance and are grateful for uh, American leadership. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, you said that regardless of what happens in the House of Representatives, that you're confident that there remains support among a vast majority of Republicans to continue supporting Ukraine. But I'm wondering what complications the administration is having to arrive at that confidence. That confidence and that statement comes from the conversations that we have had at various levels in this administration with with the uh, with House Republicans. But it's up to the Speaker of the House of Representatives to decide what to put on the floor for a vote. And you're confident that regardless of who's Speaker, I that can't. the support of the National Security Committees would be enough. Well, you're talking about the Speaker in the past tense already. Uh, I, I, we're not going to do that, and I'm not going to hypothesize about what the Speakership looks like this afternoon or tomorrow. All I can tell you is that we continue to have conversations with House Republicans at various levels, including the leadership level, uh, and there's widespread support, a majority of support for helping Ukraine. That's what we're basing our confidence on. How much more difficult do you expect each successive discussion over each new package of aid for Ukraine to become? And have you communicated to allies that there will at some point be, reach a point where there is just simply not support to pass another Yeah, this gets to that whole blank check argument. Uh, you know, that. Uh, there's been no blank check. Every single assistance package that's been going, that's gone to Ukraine, whether it's drawdown or uh, contracting funds, the USAI funds, every single one, there's consultations with members of Congress and all the relevant leadership uh, on what we're putting in the package, why it's there, when it's going to get there, and there's transparency throughout the whole process. So do I anticipate any changes that have to be had in consultations in Congress? No, because we've been doing it since day one. On the Haiti multilateral mission, um, has the $200 million that the U.S. pledged already been paid for, and if so, how? And then do you have any specifics been on paid the, for? Yes. You mean like been, what's the mechanism been paid for? provided? Yes. Been, well, is there a mechanism already in place to pay for it, or are you going to have to ask Congress for that funding? Uh, yeah, I'd refer you to state and DOD. State volunteered $100 million, uh, and so did uh, DOD and some enabling support, but you really should go to those agencies for how they're going to account for that. Do you have any logistics um, that are being provided by, any specifics on the logis logistics being provided by the Pentagon, and, you know, will the U.S. send any personnel on the ground to Haiti? So the, the mil U.S. military will provide some enabling support. I suspect that, again, I refer you to my co colleagues over there, but I suspect it'll be mostly in the realm of logistics and sustainment, maybe some transportation and that kind of thing. Uh, and there are no plans right now to put American uh, troops in, inside the support mission. Thank you so much. Um, we understand that the French minister raised the issue of Nagorno Karabakh during the call this morning, um, and she advocated for strong international support for Armenia. So what's the administration take on this? Well, we, yeah, we uh, continue to watch this situation very, very closely. Obviously, still very, very tense. Uh, we're mindful that vast majority, I think almost all ethnic Armenians now have left uh, and there's a significant humanitarian uh, assistance issue, which is why uh, the USAID uh, administrator uh, Samantha Power was just there actually just a few days ago. We have put a DART team on the ground. We have contributed, I think it's $11 million in humanitarian assistance just right now. So we're very focused on the humanitarian situation and doing what we can to alleviate the suffering, but also uh, again, encouraging, uh, certainly uh, encouraging Azerbaijan to meet its commitments, its publicly stated commitments here, uh, and re reinforce our support for the ethnic Armenians who are still there. Uh, two more. Uh, good, good afternoon, Admiral. The, uh, I want to ask you about uh, Tuberville. Tup the continued <coughs> Tuberville hold on military promotion to the Pentagon. Yeah. He says, quote, as long as the Pentagon keeps the unlawful elective abortion policy in place, my holds will remain, end quote. That said, will the Pentagon rescind that policy to move those nominations through? I don't speak for the Pentagon anymore. I, I'm, uh, I'm here now, uh, so I'd refer you certainly to my, my Pentagon colleagues. That said, uh, they have spoken to this many times. First of all, the senator's just wrong. 
It's not an unlawful policy. It's perfectly legal, perfectly in keeping with the law. Uh, does it violate the Hyde Amendment? It doesn't. They, they've done a legal scrub at this at the at DOD. It's just wrong. I'm not, while I won't speak for the Pentagon, I'm certainly just not going to let a lie and falsehood live on. It's not a violation of the law. It is a legal policy. All that they're doing is providing a tra uh, some travel uh, ability for female members of the military or their families. They're stationed in a place where the laws are restricted. They can go get the reproductive care that they deserve, that they have every right to expect from the United States military. So I'm sorry, Senator Bluebill's just wrong. The policy's not unlawful. Now, if, if he wants to take that up in Congress and, and pass new legislation, well, certainly that's the writ of Congress. But nothing that the Department of Defense or Secretary Austin is doing is unlawful. Nothing. If the national security is truly at risk, as the administration says, then isn't keeping that abortion policy in place, in effect, superseding national uh, security? How? I'm not sure I understand. Not, you want to get the, the, the nominations through, right? You take back the policy. Oh, so, you, so the suggestion is that we should just uh -huh. turn our backs. No, I get it. I didn't say it was yours. But the suggestion is we should just turn our backs on one in five of every, every person in the United States military, let alone their family members, just so we can get these, these officers confirmed. That's the suggestion that I think you're elucidating. Um, and that just would be an egregious violation of the covenant that we make, the military makes, with the people that sign up and volunteer. Remember this, they're volunteers. There's not conscription, there's no draft. People volunteer for this. And when they volunteer for that duty, they have every right to expect that they're going to get the health care they need. And let me tell you something else. A healthy force is a ready force. So don't talk to me about national security being impaired. Um, uh, the one impairing national security is Senator Tuberville, not only because he's depriving the military of necessary leadership in the field and at sea, but he's also willing to deprive female members of the military, 20% of the force, from necessary health care. That both is a violation of national security. My last one. How does it all end? How does it all wrap up? I can't possibly predict that, but you know, I could tell you how I'd like it to end. I'd like it to see, and I think I speak certainly for everybody in the administration, for Mr. Tuberville to lift his ridiculous hold. James, you have a last question. Thank you very much, Kareem, and uh, and thank you, Admiral. Um, by the way, the use of elucidating, I think, justifies my earlier description of your loquacity. Um, two questions on the subject at hand. Obviously, President Putin has a vested interest in um, the United States Congress uh, voting to deprive Ukraine of additional support and assistance. Um, do you uh, discern any efforts by the Kremlin to exploit, uh, aggravate, or otherwise shape the discord that we're seeing in our political system right now? Well, I am actually really glad uh, that you asked that, James. Uh, uh, Bear with me. The short answer to your question is, can I, can I, do we see any tangible, demonstrable efforts by Putin to capitalize on this? I can't say that we do. I've seen no indication that, that he's done something or is working inside the propaganda machine of his to exploit this. Uh, it wouldn't be unlike him to do that, but the truth to answer to your question is I haven't seen any proof of that. That said, and this is the important point that I think your question raises, is that by denying support for Ukraine, by being willing to just walk away from helping them defend themselves, you're handing Mr. Putin a, a win, a victory. Uh, not only a propaganda win, because his whole narrative has been this is the West versus Russia, it's NATO versus Russia, we didn't start this war, they, pro they forced us into it, all of it a lie. And if we just walk away from Ukraine, we basically confirm his lie. Uh, we basically say to him, yeah, you know what? You're right, Putin. You were the wronged, you, you, you were the victim here. Uh, and we, we hand him that kind of an advantage. It is, uh, it's, a, it's egregious. And it, it, it absolutely plays right in to his false narrative of how this war started. The other question is this. Uh, you, Jake Sullivan, President Biden, um, Jean-Pierre, uh, all those who speak for this administration uh, on this subject matter have, over the last several weeks, continued um, without deviation to project confidence that this renewed funding is going to come from this government. <coughs> um, and you have issued those predictions.
expressions of confidence as the discernible support for Ukraine's funding has eroded almost day by day. Um, and we're now in a position where not even a stopgap measure would include uh, that funding. Um, so on that call with the allies today and in government-to-government uh, -government interactions with the allies, don't you risk um, uh, selling the reputation of, of the United States and of these individual leaders, um, including the president, uh, for providing uh, frank and candid advice and counsel when you're, you're, you're projecting confidence uh, as this sort of funding ship is sinking steadily? So I push back on your uh, on your uh, notion that there's a discernible erosion. There hasn't been. I've been answering questions up here now for almost an hour, telling you that we're we're confident in the conversations we're having with leadership in the House that support will, from for Ukraine will continue. That the vast majority of Republicans in the House support this. Not not to mention Republicans in the Senate and of course uh, all Democrats. So there's no discernible erosion. We have a small number of very vocal, extreme Republicans in the House that are pushing back on this, but they don't represent their caucus and they don't represent uh, their leadership. And what would erode confidence uh, in the United States would be for us to do Putin's bidding and to just roll over and stop supporting Ukraine. So uh, for, for all of those who claim they're hawks on national security and they believe in a strong military and they, they wanna make sure that America can meet its national security interests, if you believe that, you ought to be signing up for support for Ukraine because you can tie a direct line to our national security interests and the ability of Ukraine to defeat Putin as an aggressor. Did the president discuss a plan B with the leaders today in case this funding doesn't materialize? I won't go into more detail than what I expressed in my opening statement. There was a, there was a good chunk of the conversation on uh, what happened on Capitol Hill and the, and the need for continued support for Ukraine, the president's confidence in that support. It was echoed by uh, a re resounding unanimity among those members on the call that, that A, they appreciate what America has done uh, and continues to do, how important it is for the United States to lead and support Ukraine and their confidence in their countries that they'll be able to do the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. You found Swifty. Okay. Will, go for it. Um, so I know you've been asked this before, but uh, you know, should Democrats help uh, McCarthy retain the speakership? And uh, I'm curious, um, is this sustainable? Is the chaos that we're seeing, if there is uh, a change, uh, sustainable in the long term? The president spoke to this on Sunday. He got the question um, about the speakership. He said, I don't have a vote in this. I'm just paraphrasing what the president said. And he also uh, said that uh, it is up to the leadership. It is up to House Democrats. It is up to leadership uh, to decide how they're going to move forward on on um, on this process. I'm just we're just not going to get involved. We're not going to uh, uh, put our you know uh, put our you know tip the scale here, our fun, uh, thumb on the scale. Look, and it's not it's not new, right? When there's been other leadership changes in the last two years, we have not commented. We have allowed. Congress to do their 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 role in this to move forward with their process. So this is this isn't anything new. Now, as it relates to the chaos that we see in the House Republicans, yeah, it's chaotic, right? There is chaos there. Uh, a small majority of their conference is indeed causing chaos. We just have to go back to Saturday and what we saw, what they almost marched us to, which is shutting down the government, uh, and. Uh, you know, it is not beneficial to the American people. It is not helpful to the American people to have to see that going on. Uh, but uh, we're not going to we're not going to weigh in on the leadership. That's not something that we have done in the last two years that we've been here. And you thought about the, the long term, the long term effect, the long term potential effect of the chaos. I mean, look, as I said, we saw very clear, clearly on Saturday, what that chaos could have led us to a shutdown of the government because of what House, these extreme House Republicans wanted to do, which is push forward policies that were harmful to Americans across the country, right? That's what we saw. Uh, and, um, you know, we kept on saying for weeks on end, it is the job of Congress to keep the government open. It is their basic responsibility, and they were able to do that on Saturday. But we shouldn't have never have gotten there. And we got there because of the chaos that we uh, continue to see in House Republicans, that extreme group of House Republicans. Okay. 
you. This is a president who served in Congress for a long time, who deeply believes in working across the aisle. But if Speaker McCarthy is ousted because he was working with Democrats, is there any chance of bipartisanship on Capitol Hill moving forward? And if so, why does the president believe that? There's always a chance for bipartisanship. This is a president that has shown that. He passed the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, right? He helped, he led that, he helped push that forward. He signed that. There's the uh, uh, Chips and Science Act, there's the PACT Act, there's more than 400 pieces of bipartisan uh, legislation that he signed into law. So certainly this is a president that believes in that. There's his unity agenda that he believes there's a way to work together with Congress on pushing really important key, uh, key uh, policies that's important uh, to the American people. So this is a president, of course he believes in bipartisanship. Of course he does. But, you know, Congress has to fix their own problem, their own leadership issue, right? Specifically, the speaker and his caucus and his conference. That, that is for them to fix. That is for them to deal with. Uh, and so, you know, again, it is, it, it is their chaos. Uh, it is something that uh, is not what the American people want to see. They were very clear about this. They want to continue to see us work in a bipartisan way. And of course, the president wants to continue to do that. But given the chaos that you just talked about, looking forward, does the president realistically think that he can accomplish anything with Congress as, in the coming year? As you know, this is a president that is optimistic. He says this all the time. He is an optimistic president. So of course, he's always going to find ways to do that, to work together. I mean, it wasn't too long ago, just a couple of months ago, that he came together with Congress and put, put forth a bipartisan piece of legislation to deal with the budget, right? A budget agreement that was in, done in a bipartisan way. So that was not too long ago. So does he believe we can continue to do that? Yes. Is, is there chaos in the House Republicans? Absolutely. That is something that they have to deal with. That is something that they need to figure out how they are going to fix that. Uh, and that is something I believe that the American people want to continue, want to continue to see that bipartisanship. So the president is, op is optimistic as we move forward. Does the speaker's support for an impeachment proceeding against President Biden affect the president's and Democrats' instinct not to help him with a lifeline now? So I can't speak for Democrats, right? Uh, that is something that Democrats in the House, that's something that they have to figure out how they're going to move forward uh, with that, with the, 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 the leadership there. I'm not going to speak for them, not going to speak on how they feel about the, the speaker. Certainly they can speak for themselves. As it relates to the impeachment, we've been very clear. We're going to focus on the business of the American people. Look, if Republicans, that's what they want to do, that's what they want to waste their time doing, is going after a president who they themselves, their own witnesses have said, and we saw this hearing just last week, that there is no evidence, no evidence, but still they want to move forward with an impeachment. Look, the president's going to continue to do, for example, what we announced today, these 10 drugs that are now going to be part of negotiating with Medicare so that we can lower cost for Americans, so that, so that we can actually beat Big Pharma, which is what the president has been able to do because of the Inflation Reduction Act, that's what the president's gonna do. He's gonna continue to figure out how we're gonna lower cost for the American people. That's bionomics, that's what's important, building, building up, growing the middle class, and that's, the, that's what the president's gonna focus on. Do the president's son Hunter pleaded not guilty to a gun charge in court today. Does the White House have a comment on that? Has the president been in touch with his son about it? So here's what I'll say about that, and I've said this many times. You've heard it from the president. The president loves him, his son. He's going to continue to support him as he rebuilds his, his life. Uh, I'm not going to uh, speak to any private conversations that this president has with any member of his family that is private. And just to remind you all, as you all know, you guys reported on this, this is an independent Department of Justice uh, investigation. It has been, uh, and which has been led by one of the prosecutors from the last administration. And so we're just not going to comment on the investigation specifically. Okay, Justin. Um, Chris, just to follow on Jeff, could you maybe explain I think a lot of people have a question of why the White House wouldn't sort of exploit this opportunity to um, take a leadership role in this situation, especially when there's policy goals and Ukraine being the most obvious that uh, you want to accomplish in the House. Why not offer a lifeline to Speaker McCarthy of, of certain things? Is it because the relationship's been spoiled um, by impeachment or by other things? Is it because you don't fundamentally trust him to be able to... None of those things. Him? None of those things, Justin. It's just the basic, basic fact that we have, uh, as we've moved here through the last two years, that we just don't get involved when it comes to leadership. 
right? That is something, and that has, we have been consistent about that, right? We have been consistent about that in the last two years. So we're gonna be consistent about this too. We're not going to get involved when it comes to who, who either the Senate or the House is going to choose to, to lead them. That has been our consistent uh, play for the last two years. And then I just wanted to loop back on yesterday. I think there was some confusion over President's remarks the day before and um, when he referenced a deal. Uh, do you have any more clarity about what the president was referring to in that situation? I mean, look, what we were what we were um, really referring to is that the speaker's the speaker's uh, McCarthy's public comments. Really. So there's no. Just to be clear, there's no behind-the-scenes deal. Or you were just saying the president was just saying, uh, you know, we've seen the speaker say that he supports Ukraine aid. We've seen Republicans say they support Ukraine aid. So we think there's an agreement, even though we haven't had a private. Uh, look, I'm not going to go into depth. What I'm I'm going to let the, the president's words stand, and I'm not going to elaborate on it. What I will say is that what we are always going to show and point to, as the admiral did just moments ago, as he was standing uh, by this lectern is that the speaker speaker mccarthy has been very clear about this uh, that he ha that he wants to make sure that ukraine continues to get the the weapons support uh and i'm paraphrasing here uh that uh, that they need right that they need on the battlefield he has said this multiple times he said this on sunday he has, continues to to say this and there is overwhelming majority of support uh in in congress to continue uh that's that uh, uh that funding for ukraine that is where that is where we are. That is what the president wants to see, and I speak for the president on this, right? Making sure that we want to see that bipartisan support, uh, and that's the ag agreement. That is the agreement uh, that the speaker has made publicly, publicly, not just to uh, not just to, I mean, really to the to the Ukrainian people, right? That commitment that he has made to the Ukrainian people. That's what we want to see. And that's what the president is going to continue to really uh, be clear about. And he said this on Sunday as well. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, when is the last time that the president and the House Speaker spoke, and how would you describe their relationship? I, I just don't have any private conversations to read out. Uh, I really, I don't. Uh, what I can say is, uh, and he has said this to me, the president, that he is, uh, he is in, you know, he has uh, regular conversations with members of Congress, whether it's the House or the Senate. I just don't have any public, uh, private, pardon me, private conversations to speak would to. Would you describe their relationship? How would you describe? I, I mean, I, I mean, look, the president has been president for now two and a half years. He was a vice president for eight years, as you all know. He was a, a senator for 34 years. Uh, he has relationships with Republicans and Democrats throughout his career, right? Uh, it is not unusual. It is something that the president uh, certainly um, appreciates and uh, certainly leans into the relationships that he has had. I'm just not going to go, I'm not going to characterize that relationship. Uh, you have seen him with the speaker multiple times, me, especially during uh, the budget uh, negotiations a couple months ago. I'm just not going to characterize it from here. One uh, unrelated question, sure. and that is that um, it appears that culinary workers in Nevada are preparing to potentially go on strike. Uh, I want to get a sense of uh, what the president, what the White House's position on, is on that. Um, would the president stand with those striking workers? Would he potentially go there? I just want to get a sense of what you I don't have anything on his schedule, but I can say what the president has said and what I have said uh, on behalf of the president when it comes to uh, workers and union members uh, having being allowed to, to strike. He supports that, right? He's, he believes that they have the right uh, to uh, to you know to to uh, to get that fair pay, to get the fair benefits, and to fight for that, right? Uh, and so that is uh, that is what he believes. He believes that they should have that so that they can indeed so be able to support their families, be able to support uh, be able to support themselves. And Las Vegas, as you know, has a long history, a uh, long union history uh, of workers uh, uh, and that of, of union workers that have helped build the city. And so, look, the president is always going to support union workers. He's always going to support working people. Uh, that is not new. He has done that over the course of the last two years. And, uh, and certainly, he also believes in collective bargaining. He believes that both sides should be able to come to the table in good faith and work through and work through those, those issues and uh, really be able to negotiate uh, fair pay uh, and fair benefits for workers. Uh, thanks a lot, Kareem. Uh, you spoke about how President Biden has had this long career of public service, has many relationships with 
members on both sides of the aisle. What are his interactions that he's had with Congressman Steve Scalise of Louisiana? I don't have anything to read out, any private conversations to read out, but obviously, again, the president, as you just stated in your question, has had long, uh, long history of having relationships with uh, the other side of the aisle, right, which he believes is incredibly important to move forward uh, important policies and legislations for the American people, as you've seen him do in the last two years. I just don't have any, I don't have any uh, specific conversations to lay out. Uh, good, yeah, um, has, the, has the White House any comment on the carjacking of Representative where are, has the president reached out to him? And more broadly, does it yeah. say anything about safety and uh, crime in the district? So what we saw happen, uh, the, the reporting that we saw happen to the congressman obviously was unacceptable. Uh, the president did have an opportunity to speak with the congressman today. Uh, and uh, we will co always continue uh, to speak out against any sort of violence. Uh, and we've been consistent here uh, um, in this administration. We are certainly grateful and relieved that the congressman was unharmed. Uh, and we are thankful to the law enforcement to have reacted so quickly. And, uh, and so look, this is the president, uh, unlike Republicans, has actually put forth uh, billions of dollars, or uh, has taken action to make sure that there are billions of dollars in his budget every year. He, and through the American American Rescue uh, Plan, let's not forget, there were billions of dollars in his Amer American Rescue Plan so that local uh, communities and, and um, state and federal police as well, law enforcement, were able uh, to make sure that they had the funding so that they can hire more law enforcement. And that was incredibly important to the president so that they can make sure that their communities were safe. This is something that the president has done and Republicans have not helped. And I know you have, I know you're going to follow up on that. What's, what's your question? Well, the first follow up would be, how are you going to blame Republicans? Republicans for this. Isn't D.C. run by a bunch of Democrats? I'm going to speak to what the president has done, right? The president has been very, very straightforward about what he has done to make sure that communities are safe. American Rescue Plan, not one Republican in Congress voted for it. Not one. There were billions of dollars in that plan, in that, in that act, to make sure communities across the country got funding so that they can indeed hire more police officers so that they can keep their communities safe. Republicans had nothing to do with that. They were not involved in that. They decided not to vote on the American Rescue Plan. That's just a fact. So if President Biden's policies are helping bring crime down, would he be comfortable with somebody borrowing his Corvette and parking it on the street overnight in Southeast DC? I'm not gonna get into the facts about what this president has done in this presidency. One thing that we're, somebody was asking me about bipartisanship, he was able, as it relates to guns, he was able to come together, right? We saw Democrats and Republicans come together and have the first piece of gun anti-gun violence uh, prevention legislation in 30 years. And that's something that this president was able to do. If a member of Congress is not safe on the streets of the nation's capital, who is? Look, we're grateful and relieved that the cong congressman is unharmed. We understand what communities are going through across the country, not just in DC. That's why the president took action very early on in his administration to get the American Rescue Plan done without the help of Republicans. That's why every time he puts forward his budget, he makes sure there are billions of dollars to deal with crime. That's just a fact. All you got to look is what the president has been able to do this past two years. There's always going to be work, more work to be done, but the fact is the president has taken action. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks,